The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the Bureau of the Nine finds the one ring to bind the tendrils of the Weberverse. A hardcover rain gonna fall. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We have an interview with David Weber and his great consulting group, Bu9, this time, who also co-authored House of Steel, the Honorverse Companion with David. We had a bunch of Bu9 contributors in the studio here, as well as David Weber, and a fun, raucous, and informative time was had by all. Our time together stretched out, so this is part one of a two-part interview. And we also continue with the complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. Now here's the news. Happy New Year! 2017 is nearly upon us, or maybe already surging over us like a tsunami, depending on when you're listening to this. In either or either case, we have new hardcovers out this month, and we have some good ones. First, Eric Flint has completed the next Ring of Fire alternate history series solo novel, 1636 The Ottoman Onslaught. This is the long-awaited Ring of Fire novel leading to the battle at the gates of Vienna. But of course, Eric whoops it up Grantville style. Also out is The Golden Gate. This is a near-future adventure by Robert Butner. Live forever or die trying. When the world's richest man is the victim of a car bomb and literally blown off the Golden Gate Bridge, the attack is attributed to terrorists and the world moves on. But some still wonder. Was Manuel Colibri targeted? Because, as Silicon Valley rumor has it, he was about to make the dream that people alive today can live to be 1,000 come true. Two people are pursuing the truth. Tech journalist Kate Boyle and Iraq War veteran Ben Shepard race through the Bay Area, chasing the only clues the reclusive Colibri left behind. They discover not only each other, but a cosmic secret that can change human history and may cost them their lives. Hey, that sounds suspenseful. So, 1636, The Ottoman Onslaught by Eric Flint and The Golden Gate by Robert Butner are now available at booksellers everywhere. What a way to ring in the new year. This is part one of a two-part interview with David Weber and members of the Honorverse Consulting Group, Bu9. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. I want to welcome David Weber and several, quite a few members of the of Bu9, the David Weber Honorverse Consulting Group, to the podcast. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. It's um, it's a, we had a, we had a female uh, last time, I believe, but it's all guys here this time. Um, was here last time. Joel. Joel was here, yes. Uh, David Weber is the uh, internationally best-selling Honor Harrington series uh, creator and uh, the Honorverse within which that series is set. David's Honor Harrington science fiction novels have sold millions of copies over the years. David is also the author of many other Bane books, including the epic fantasy Bazel series with uh, Sword of the South, the latest entry. David has seven, no, David has 28 New York Times bestsellers. This is what Marla came up came up when we counted them the other day and there are over seven and a half and i believe it's eight million david weber books in print now the latest entry in the honor harrington series is a fantastic solo novel by david weber which is the shadow which is shadow of victory and it's now out at booksellers everywhere also at many booksellers is house of steel the honor harrington companion by david weber and budine um we happen to uh, we have several key members of B9 here, and uh, let me introduce some of them. We have Chris Weave, who is a naval analyst, former professor of wargaming at the Naval War College, and the president and designated extrovert at B9. We have Arius Kaufman, 
who is formerly a civilian analyst for the Navy and currently a graduate student in education. His area of expertise for BU9 is um, human terrain analyst, human terrain analyst. Uh, we have Marcus Wilms, who is a, is it Wilms? Wilms. <laughs> Wilms. Wilms. Is, who is a tax advisor who lives in Germany. He is, uh, wait for it, Bunein's expert on the uh, Adermani Empire and all things German. He He's probably going to win. Where are you from in Germany? Where are you? Uh, Paderborn, that's in, more in the western part. Ah. My wife is uh, is German. She's, my wife is German oh. from uh, Frankfurt area. So. Yeah, that's the one who lost my airport today. <laughs> yeah. She's Hessian. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, he's probably going to win the award this year for longest distance travel to get to HonorCon. We'll talk about what HonorCon is as well um, in a moment. We have Mark Guttis, who is a practicing attorney. Mark indexes and writes about legal systems and governments of Honorverse within BU9. We have Brian Haven, who is the secretary for BU9. He is a retired naval submariner who went on to work for NASA and then Apple before taking over at general, as general manager for Atlantis Games and Comics in Norfolk, Virginia. His contributions include general organization support and the pointed question now and again. <laughs> the pointed question. The pointed question is like, is like, what? <laughs> and we're uh, doing this, why? Did you really want to do that? Well, we have also Bill Edwards and Greg Whitaker. Can, uh, and I didn't get short bios for you guys. Can you uh, fill us in on what your, who you are and what your role is in BU9? Okay. Um, Bill Edwards. I'm one of the... Uh, Geeks and uh, David's little corral of talent. We keep him in the back room. Yes. Yes. Feed me sunlight from time to time. <laughs> um, I like taking current technology and taking a look at what David writes about it and then tries to massage it into, here's how it might work. Uh, I bring in to the table uh, 20 years in electronic warfare weapon systems and some intelligent stuff, uh, how it all integrates together into weapon systems, how it will and will not work. Um, even an example of some of the stuff that you've had in your stories, but no real meat on the table. One of the things I'll be presenting in this uh, at the uh, conference is what a wedge signature looks like if you're looking at a dreadnought, super dreadnought, cruiser, destroyer, and how you can tell them apart. It is based on fact, believe it or not. I, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Those wedges are important plot devices. Um, and Greg. Uh, my name's Greg Whitaker. I'm uh, an Hold avid reader. to you. My name is Greg Whitaker. I'm an avid fan and reader of David's books and help do fact checking as well as a war gamer. So I've helped on uh, couple of projects and sits. All right. Um, well, we should probably mention a few basics just to, uh, although, uh, you know, we've, we've had podcasts with, with, um, with you folks before, so uh, I'm sure that a lot of our uh, listeners know who BU9 is, but can we, uh, what does it mean? What is it? Chris, do you want to, or David? Um, BU9 started many, many years ago. Put that thing ago. right in front of you, if you would. Me and I started many, many years ago when a very unwary Tom Pope <laughs> strayed into a morass that he still hasn't extricated himself from, um, primarily because yes. he was working on um, the war game that became Sets. Um, and he was the fortunate soul who was deputized uh, to ask me questions about how to make this work. And um, in the process, uh, we became very close friends. And BU9 sort of accreted around Tom and, and sits, kind of like coral growing on a wreck. Okay. <laughs> because, yeah. because is that a wreck? Tom, <laughs> no, no, the honor versus the wreck. Uh, would but, that make but, him Barnacle Bill? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it would, but I wasn't going to say that. Uh, there's a lot but, of truth in that. Tom would reach out to people who had interests in the honorverse or in gaming or in both for expertise. And so he gradually started assembling this, this coterie of people who were, were both knowledgeable in their own real life areas 
and who were interested in science fiction and the universe. Um, and eventually I said to them, you guys really need to incorporate because you are so deeply involved in what's going on with the universe and so forth that you're the guys we need to do the companions and, and whatnot. And you need some sort of an actual structure. And there was cries of, oh no, a structure, we're doomed, coming out of View 9. But that, that's who View 9 is. They're a bunch of uh, people who have become friends uh, of each other and of mine uh, over the years. And probably between them and Tom especially, know more about the universe than I do. Um, I write the books and I keep the plot line moving forward and I have the tech bible and everything else. They have done a tremendous job of fleshing out details, filling holes in, in, what, I, in what I had, and in keeping track of what I've done and of what I intend to do. I have a tendency now, I'm working on a book and I'll call Tom and I'll say, Tom, I can't remember, what was the performance we gave the Mark 13 missile? Okay, out of the Mod 7B launcher. And he said, just a sec, babe. And he said, okay, there it is. I'm like, good, go. There's a reason why Tom is designing the tech for the Manticore Ascendant novels with Tim Zahn instead of me doing it. Because Tom is probably the person in the entire world who is the most inside my brain in terms of where I see this technology coming from and going to. But I didn't trust myself to create technology that was 400 years less advanced, that didn't feel like it was inevitably going to lead to where the universe is now. And Tom has done an outstanding job, I think, yeah, of building a, that era, earlier era of, of warfare. It's a wonderful series. It's uh, the the books are um, a call to uh, a call to duty, a call to arms, and uh, a call to vengeance, call to vengeance the one coming that's being out. Worked on now that has been yeah. it's been stuck for a while because of other commitments and some health issues that I had. Um, I don't think we're in trouble on the delivery schedule on it yet, but I really need to start grappling with it in ways that I haven't at this point. I've been through one full pass of the manuscript with Tom. But he and Tim really need me to be, to do another one. And also, I am responsible for structuring the, um, the combat sequences. Um, and uh, I'm probably going to spend some time talking with Tom about that before I do it. Although he's done a wonderful job of giving me everything I need uh, <laughs> for the parameters of the battles and the tech involved. But he and I will probably kick it around a little bit before I write an actual yeah. We have we have pulled it from where we were having it before, so that we can give you that time. Oh, thank you. That's um, <laughs> we're going to uh, reschedule it uh, probably in probably in fall twenty seventeen something okay. like that. So uh, well, I, I I hate that I hate that you had to pull it, but there were just <laughs> no, there's no no way. So, but you've had uh, David, uh, David. Perhaps you can. Exp Explain the crunch you were under. Recently. Oh. It, it it wasn't. Was it anybody's fault? Or it was, just, well, if it was anybody's just, fault, it was mine, and I don't really think it was mine. Okay, it all really goes back to um, the road to hell. Okay, because that which was which is paved with good. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Tony has told me no more books with hell in the title. No, no. Um, but. Um, Road to Hell was the first novel for Joelle, okay, and so it was a learning process for her, all right. I knew that was going to be the case going in, so I'd kind of allowed an extra month in my total production time for that. What I hadn't allowed for was that it had been, what, 10 years, something like that, since, I, since we finished um, Hell Hath No Fury. What that meant was, and I realized this as soon as I started putting the tech bible together for Joelle, I had to go back and research those, those books as if they had been written by someone else because of the level of detail for these two totally different civilizations. I mean, they have totally different technologies on identical planets, each of whom has its own name for every flipping point on the face of the planet. It seemed like a good idea at the time. It was it? a great idea at the time, okay? <laughs> but, but on each planet. 
Uh, yes. You know, and so you're going, oh my God, you know, it's like, okay, we have, we have 17 universes in this chain and they all have different place names for every spot in it. You know, it's not like we can say, okay, it's Caramel, it's Carmel, California, and it's Caramel, California. No, 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 no. You know, it's a totally different thing. And you got different cosmologies, you know, the whole nine yards. So first, I had to completely research the book from scratch, the entire universe. Then we had to write it. The book wound up being largish. Um, by my standards, which means really large by anybody else's. Um, and in the meantime, Joelle is coming in cold to the spot that Linda Evans had filled in the earlier iterations of the books. And so we went through more drafts than I expected to go through initially. Okay, Joelle is a very, very strong storyteller, but what she was doing, and I think a lot of first authors do this, is she was so worried about word count that she wasn't giving herself enough to make, to make the story move smoothly and capable for the reader to follow. And so she and I talked about it, and I said, just go back and write it however long it has to be, okay? And if, God forbid, we wind up with a long book, you know, and it's too long, we can figure out what to take out at that point, but we have to have it to take out first. So we got the book done, and I got it in two and a half months late from my original projected date, which was well ahead of where you guys needed it. But then that two and a half month delay hit the next project, which was the original draft of Shadow of Victory. I handed in Shadow of Victory, and Tony had other Tony, um, had uh, a couple of editorial comments about it that were very well taken, but that required me to think about how it was going to restructure. And in the meantime, the deadline for the next tour novel delivery is coming down on top of me. So then I had to write it, and it wraps up the war that's been being fought. So there's a lot of stuff that had to go into it. So while I was getting it done, I had this moment of, you know, Eureka, I'm sitting in the bathtub. I have the solution for what needed to be done with Shadow of Victory, but there was no place to stop and do it. So I got um, At the Sign of Triumph finished and handed in. Um, and then I went back to um, Shadow of Victory and fixed it and handed it in. And I said, now I can take a rest. And like a week later, I get the page proofs from Tor. Well, actually, I get the copy edit. And followed very rapidly by the page proofs. And basically, I had 600,000 words of page proofs to read in nine days. Um, and it just, I basically collapsed when I got to the end of it. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. And this is, I mean, you have to read these things meticulously, but it's also about the fifth or seventh or Tenth time you've read the book through, also. Yeah, and, and, and you guys, because you had such short time on it, mm -hmm. okay, I'm getting the page proofs to read in 50 and 60 page chunks, okay? And the one thing that made me just go, uh, when I got it, is we're <laughs> pushing, 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 pushing to make the deadline, and then it's like, we can have 72 more hours right after I have emailed the final set of page proofs in. It's like, we got 72 more hours. And I was like, if I had a gun, I'd shoot myself, but I don't have the energy to get up and yeah. walk to the gun vault. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But but it was... it was Well, it's the perfect authorial bad storm. It was, it was. So, it was, it but, was the uh, perfect storm. But you managed to pull it off. Beg your pardon? You managed to pull it off. And... Well, I think probably I would have managed to keep going if I needed to with the with the crunch on there because you get into that kind of that zen state where you know you're going to do it no matter what and to be totally honest the biggest problem I've had in my life from time to time is what Sharon calls my hyper developed sense of responsibility if I tell somebody they'd have it by God I'll get it to them if it kills me uh, Jim Bain had a long conversation with me about that twice before. And apparently, I just didn't listen. Um, but, but we don't. You, if you literally die, we won't get any more books. Well, <laughs> no, I, it was really one of the really yeah. interesting things that happened. Um, let me just. All right. I was working on what was supposed to be the prequel series to Path of the Fury. 
supposed to go back to the creation of the empire, you know, under under the House of Murphy and everything else. And I'd done 80,000 words, and they were good, okay? And then I realized that I hadn't made the technology 300 years cruder, and the technology was integral to how the battles were all fought. So I had to basically throw out 80,000 words and start over again. And I was really fighting it. When I'm in the groove on a book, I do between five and 7,000 words a day. I was doing well to get 150 words a day. I'm grinding this thing out. And so Jim calls me and says, how's it going? I said, oh, it's really not going well. He said, well, how many words do you have? And I told him, he said, oof. He said, well, why don't you do something else? I said, Jim, I have a deadline to get this book in. He said, yes, and the deadline is with me. If I tell you to do something else, that's okay. <laughs> so I wound up doing, um, I think, another Honor Harrington in that time frame. But the funniest part of the story is about two, three years later, Jim calls me and says, you got 80,000 words done on that thing, didn't you? And I said, I said, yeah. He said, well, how about we just file off the serial numbers and publish it as a standalone? And I said, I can't. And he said, why not? I said, I don't have them anymore. He says, you mean you can't immediately find them? <laughs> and I said, no. I said, I've been through two computer hard drives, you know, in, in, in the meantime, and I didn't make any great effort. He said, so what you're telling me, in effect, is you threw them out. I said, well, I guess you could put it that way. And he says, you threw out 80,000 words of a David Weber novel. I said, well, I didn't see it that way. And he says, that's because you're not a mercenary publisher. <laughs> <laughs> or a reader. Yes. <laughs> so so I, said, I, said, I said, oh. And he said, repeat after me. I will never throw a manuscript out again. You know? And I said, I'm sorry, Jim. But that, that was... That could be like Hemingway's briefcase. Maybe somebody will find a hard oh, drive geez. someday. I hope. Well, yeah, I have to say, you know, that's really the only writing project that I've ever undertaken for Bain or for Tor, where I was just fighting myself every step of the way on that, on that book. And I think part of it was that the 80,000 words had felt so good that having to go back and start over again. It, well, it wasn't like I was blocked, but it was the closest I've ever come to actually blocking. And I wish I could find those 80,000 words. Me too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Me well, too. Um, well, let's, I, you know, I'd really like to, yeah, I'd like to have a uh, David Weber's process uh, podcast and talk about stuff like this sometime if we can. <laughs> maybe, maybe the good. world is not yeah. ready for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that would be fascinating. But we do have nine guys, then, right? Um, <laughs> what? Uh, how did View Nine play into uh, play into the writing of? Um, I mean, obviously, you had to write Shadow of Victory and get it done. But um, it, it, the consulting on that, or the previous Iron Harrington books, how how does it work? How does the the in practical purposes, how does it work? I'd say there was probably less of that on Shadow of Victory. Than we, on... Let me just get that mic. Better. Is that ready? Talk in this, turn it up. I'm trying. View 9 to rescue again. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, that's what View 9 does. That I'm going to leave that in. All right. Nice nice <laughs> um, probably Shadow of Victory, View 9 had less less direct input into I mean I would call Tom and discuss aspects of it with him but an awful lot of Shadow of Victory is dealing with side events for things that have already been established um, and so there was less groundbreaking involved Tom and I did some astrography about star systems but even those were already already named and, and in place Except for Vladislavic, I hadn't named that one yet. Um, but um, the earlier books, what B9 does for me is that it gives me a body of developed background that I didn't have initially that I would be filling in from scratch on my own without the work that these guys have already done. And they frequently see connections and associations in the material they're working on that I haven't had time to see yet 
even if I would have seen them on my own when I get there. And so they have done a lot to shape the, um, the developmental aspect of the background of the honor verse. Is that would you, would you yeah, say that they works. contribute um, to, then to the world building and at the same time sort of to your subconscious uh, feel for the whole world that you've created? Yeah, I would have to say that the, 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 the one member of U9 who contributes the most to my thought process has got to be Tom because he's the one that I'm constantly in, in touch with and um, is, is uh, Tom more than anybody else is my sounding board. Okay, if I have a thought, I will call Tom and I'll say, how about, you know, what do you think about this? We'll be having conversations and I'll suddenly go, ooh, ooh, shiny. And Tom knows, okay, that's the code word. David has just gone off after another rabbit, you know, and Tom starts taking notes at the other end. And then they get distributed to, to B9, and the rest of B9 goes, oi! <laughs> you know, where'd he go this time? Um, and, and then they just sort of take it in stride and say, well, we can, uh, to quote Andy, can I can rec retcon that. He can can retcon that. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> resource to have. Um, but if it's a legal question, Mark's going to hear about it, okay? Uh, if it's more of a uh, uh, naval design historical process, Chris is going to hear about it. Um, if it's electronics oriented, it's probably going to go to Bill first, okay? And, and that kind of a distributed, well, it's, it's, it's a distributed network in, in, in a lot of ways. And it all flows together at Tom Central, which is where I go when I have this. I don't call, I don't call Mark too often and say, Mark, okay, what do you, I, I have on occasion, yeah. you know, with a specific point. But I don't worry too much about calling him up and saying, you know, how does the Constitution work? Because I know he's working on that for, for House of Steel and for the next volume in the Companion. Okay, but Tom has access to all of my, I mean, I do too if I go on to the B9 page, but if I go on to the B9 page, I never get off of it. So it's much <laughs> simpler for me to say, Tom, what do I need to know, rather than start going, ooh, look, okay, let's go down, ooh, that's cool too, you know, kind of thing. It's the reason I don't do Facebook, okay? Because if I got involved in Facebook, I would never get off Facebook. Um, so what B9 does is to, They're behind the curtain in the throne room, okay? Um, and it's kind of like there's no question who's steering the honorverse, okay? But I have my tom-tom turned on <laughs> when I'm looking for routes to get from where I am to where I want to be, uh -huh. okay? Um, and that's what these guys do. That's and a that, very good analogy. You must be a writer. I, yeah, I work with words. But, but that's why they were so well placed to do the House of Steel. Okay? Because they knew all this stuff. And if they didn't know, they knew who to, who to divvy the work up to to produce what needed to be done. Maybe Chris can can you sort of shepherd and we can talk with each person a little bit about what they have contributed. Sure. Um, um, before I do that, though, I'd like to add a couple of other things that we do for David okay. um, that that weren't explicit there. So we do a lot of writing between the lines stuff, which is what uh, David was talking about. But we also do a few things like um, like Tom has an Excel spreadsheet that has every ship in the Royal Manticore and Navy going back for a really long time. So um, if you need to know... To the first ship. <laughs> to the first ship. And so if you need to know, if David needs to know, I want to call a ship such and such, it's like, no, no, you've used that before. Yes, yes. <laughs> for a ship of the same, a ship that's, a, that's in operation at the same time, you should pick another one. I suggest such and such. Yes. The other thing we do is that we have some artistic talent um, in the group. And so... Every now and then, David will, will give like a description of something in one of his drafts, and it'll be like a description of a uniform or something. And 
somebody will do a quick sketch and show it to him and go, is this what you meant? It's like, oh, no, that's not what I meant at all. Well, that's what you said. <laughs> no, it's not. You're misunderstood. <laughs> um, I believe there was some specific thing about, um, about two-inch wide stripes <laughs> on the, uh, the sleeves of ships. Or uh, sleeves of ships. Sleeves of uniforms. Yeah, well, um, it's kind of gives you a nice shiny gold sleeve. Yeah, all the way up to your to yeah, your shoulder, yeah. maybe up to your neck. Yeah. Um, so every now and then it's there's supposed to be two centimeter, two centimeter. <laughs> every every now and then there's uh, there's something that we catch mm -hmm. because we're able to actually visualize it and yeah. and present it to David. Well, it's kind of like um, when uh, John and I did the first of the of the, the March Across Country series. When we got to, I think it's the third book where he where we're fighting the Cronulta, you know the huge, you know, yeah. barbarian horde. John had them all charging across a bridge into battle. And I was like, John, you know, how big are these guys? He said, oh, they're big, about 10 feet tall. I said, okay. And the bridge is how wide? How many files across can we get? He said, about 10. Okay. I said, how long is this bridge? And he told me, I forget how long it was. And it worked out that it would have taken the horde that he had crossing the bridge about 19 hours to cross the bridge at a full run. And he just hadn't thought through to that lot. And, and I loved the way the story worked. Okay, the problem was that we couldn't do it that way. So I restructured the terrain in the capital city in a way that made that battle sequence work. Okay, it was great storytelling. It was just that he hadn't thought through that because he was, okay, airborne. Okay, what do they know about logistics? Okay, <laughs> yeah, what can I say? Logistics is for somebody else to worry about. But now, if you read one of John's novels, okay, he's got the logistics knocked, all right? But um, I, loved, I loved working with him. It was just, it was fun. Um, but it was that was that one. I was like, John, I don't think he can do that. Well, He's John's quiet. John's got his own uh, equivalent, sort of, to B9 himself these days. He's got, probably yeah. He's got his call up his little. I don't know if he calls them anything, but uh, but they'll do the same sort of. Uh, well, yeah, he calls his him. the Ring Tab, the his ring technical tab. Uh, advisory group. Ah, yeah. That works well. So I was going to go around, and I, I guess I'll start with Arias. Why don't you tell us what? Give us an example of something you've done. Um, like you, you did some of the work for House of Steel. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did. I did some of the editing for House of Steel. Um, and I think you <clears> also the, had your hand in some of the governmental stuff too. Yes, I, I had some uh, some input into the governmental stuff. Um, I'm basically a jack of all trades, so there's a lot of projects I, I get involved in. Uh, I'm not a primary on a lot of them, but I am involved in a lot of them, either as editor or contributing or whatever. Okay. Marcus. Hi. <laughs> so what sort of stuff did you do? I mean, you, you did some stuff for House of Steel, and, and I will admit <clears throat> that I was the copy editor for House of Steel. So as far as I'm concerned, everything was done by Tom because Tom was the guy who sent stuff to me to be copy edited, even the, even the parts that I rewrote, because there was some stuff that I actually did end up rewriting. Um, even in those cases, it all came from Tom. So I've actually got a pretty, um, I don't have much visibility into who did what on that book. So Marcus, what parts of House of Steel did you do and what else have you been doing? Oh, that's a good <laughs> question. So I can say I'm the, think I'm the longest member of View 9 that's, after that's Tom. I worked with him for Shipbook 2 of the Southern Army Tactical Islander Simulator. Mostly Andamani stuff. Because when I start reading Horner Harrington, I start looking for stuff about the Imperial German Navy. Oh, and basically, when Tom asked me I'm on the, at the, the German forum or the internet board about Horner Harrington if you can get some help, I could say, Yes, of course I can. And he um, <laughs> could show him. Um, dozen of internet sites where you can look for and yes I'm yeah, well, I did everything for um, Tom I'm researching and I think the most what people see is this was thing was my idea to put uh, something for what symbolize the wormhole junction of Manticore on the flag of the Empire and 
Ja. A lot of other stuff. There's a there's a lot of people in BU9 that that they can point to little individual things that got done here and they can say, yeah, that that particular thing was my idea. Um, also with House of Lies, since House of Lies is going to include the Andermani. Yeah, House of Lies is going to be the Otterverse Companion Volume 2. Yes. yes. And even as we speak, we're all actually back at our computers, hard at work on House of Lies. <laughs> um, so we're, we, we are working on House of Lies, and it's going to include the Andermani and the Havenites. And for the Andermani, uh, Marcus has been one of the key guys um, for a whole bunch of reasons, including the fact that he's the guy who speaks German. Um, <laughs> so when we need a German term for something, you know, like what would they, we got to invent a German term to describe such and such. Like at one point we were talking about um, the German, or the uh, Andermani strategic doctrine, right? So presumably there would be a word in German that would be the word that they would use to describe their strategic doctrine. We decided Farfik Nugent was not the right one. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and so... Good now. You know, it needed to be something that we couldn't just take a historic term because it wasn't a historic strategy, but it needed to feel like it was a historic term. So we um, we came up with a couple of ideas about what it should include and what the idea we were trying to get across and said, Marcus, give us a word. And so we did. And I can't remember what that word is, but you'll all read about it in House of Lies. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, see, fortunately, I write with dragon, naturally speaking. So I will just say, underbody doctrine. And it will learn that that German word, that that's what it means. Yeah. Underbody doctrine singular. I was like, okay, fine. We're good. We're good to go. Well, that's clever. I like that idea. Yeah, then I don't have to know how to, how to pronounce it. But you basically create your own language pigeon that we can, that only you know. That's right. Honor speak. Honor speak. Honor speak. Honor speak. Yeah. And God help me if I ever lose that vocabulary. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's on the server, it's on the cloud. It's, you know. So, Mark. Well, being the uh, probably the, the most technically, mathematically challenged member of the group. <laughs> no. <laughs> of Bu9. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you meant the honor verse. No, no, no. Uh, I, uh, my role has, has been in some of the, the soft sciences, uh, fleshing out the governments, fleshing out the, uh, the judicial systems. Uh, one of the things that uh, it was kind of my entry uh, ticket into BU9 was I had done an index all on my own, just for my own amusement, of the entire honorverse. And when Tom Pope saw it, uh, I understand his, his eyes got very big and it was something that caught his attention and, and that was, this was my entry into uh, to BU9. Uh, I've, a, a, as a, an attorney, uh, both from, from law school and from my career, I know how to do legal writing and in addition to uh, writing about the, the systems uh, uh, and, and also uh, go, going back and helping Tom with some of the, the legal stuff from the uh, Manticore Ascendant series. Uh, but uh, with my legal background, I've done a bit of writing in terms of creating case law in the Honorverse. Uh, uh, things like... Uh, uh, Law, a law review article for, for the Honorverse, and in doing so, help David kind of move in a direction that he was thinking about moving with the tree cats. And uh, that's, that's pretty much uh, where I've contributed to uh, moving the Honorverse forward. Does, does Manticore have a common law system? I Manticore don't... does have a common law system. Yeah. So that, one would think. Yeah. Well, that was, that was always established. Mm -hmm. But it had never been it had never been um, fleshed out and developed. Um, I mean, there are aspects of um, one of the fun things about that part of it is when Marcus when when Mark Mark Marcus too many marks too many and we sat them right next to yes, each other you too. Did. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but uh, when Mark starts asking me asking me questions, um, it's it's kind of fun when we start looking at the differences between the manticorn system. 
and with somebody coming from uh, a U.S. law, a U.S. perspective, uh, would assume be when you start filling in the, the background with your subliminal knowledge of, of the system. Um, for example, um, I don't think it's ever been a factor in the books, but Manticore uses the loser pays rule for, for uh, tort law. Um, so if you bring suit, you better win, because if you don't, you get stuck with the loser's uh, legal costs as well as your own. And there are some other distinct differences between that and, and, and our system. And Mark helps bring those into very sharp focus with me, for me when he says, whoa, what? <laughs> you know, and I say, oh, excuse oh, oh, okay, I can make that work, you know, uh, kind of thing. Um, which is what happens a lot um, with Bu 9 in the Honorverse, is they'll ask me a question and I'll give them an answer, and they'll go, oh, and then they'll go away and look at the logical implications of, of the answer. One of the things that I've always tried in my writing to do is to look at the logical implications of what I do with a character or a piece of technology or something like that. But to be honest, the universe is so flippin' big now, okay, that I don't have time to look at all of the logical implications until I need them in the story that I'm writing. Okay, well, what Bu9 has done for me in many cases is to look at those logical implications before I got there. Okay? Another thing that they do for me, and I don't know if I ever told you guys this, when I started writing the Honorverse, and when I start writing any story, okay, the limits on the character's toolbox is almost more important than the capabilities in the character's toolbox because it defines the parameters they have to work within to solve the problem. And so I am always very stern with myself. Okay, this is the tech toolbox I set up. No, you can't change it arbitrarily to solve a problem. You can do R&D, you know, the toolbox can evolve, but at this point in time, you can't unveil the god weapon that your character needed, okay? All right, well, what Bu9 does is they fence me in sometimes because they have developed the implications of what I was saying. And when I get there, the implications that they've developed make so much sense that even if it was like, no, that wasn't really where I wanted to go because I was going to do this, I find myself constrained to work within the limitations that they've established. And I think that in many ways that makes the story stronger because my characters, right along with me, have to figure out how we're going to solve this problem with this set of tools. Okay? Um, and I think a lot of writers don't ever quite grasp, and many, maybe even the majority of readers don't appreciate how successful writing depends on limits almost more than it does on opportunities for, for your characters. Um, and that's one thing that Bu9 does. I mean, it's not like they say, oh, well, we'll, we'll fix it now. We'll nail his feet to the floor on this. Uh, but the fact that they've established those parameters for me going in, and that in many cases they aren't parameters that would have occurred to me on my own, forces me to deal with them mm -hmm. in solving the problems it's, for my characters. It, it sounds like it, it might, in some ways, be like, say, a sonnet where you have certain certain restrictions placed on you that you have to abide by if you're going to write a sonnet. If you're going to write a David Weber novel, you're going to abide by what what these I, guys have. Well, maybe not quite that. Well, no, with sonnet, with sonnet, you're talking you're talking form and structure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in this, what you're talking is capabilities and opportunities. Um, and so it's, it's, I, I, I see where you're, you're going with that analogy. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't think that there is a good analogy. I think this is kind of just the way it is, it is. if you see yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about it, trying to think of a, a, of a, a way to phrase it. Sure. But I mean, seriously, it's a matter of, it's a matter of, um, delimiting possibilities. 
um, which then compels me to make those possibilities work to solve the problem for my characters. And that way I can't just fall into the lazy way of solving them. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. There's been a few instances, though, where by further defining the technology, et cetera, um, we've probably also created opportunities for you mm. rather than just creating limits. Oh, absolutely. But, but, and, and they're both in, incredibly valuable to me. But from the storytelling perspective, the limits... They make you think. Yeah. They make you work well, harder to... Yeah, it's kind of like... All right. People really like Honor Harrington. And they say, you know what, the only thing I don't like about Honor is that she doesn't make mistakes. And I'm sitting here, well, let me see. She shot a prisoner of war out of hand without trial. She just missed because somebody shoved her arm after she pulled the trigger. Okay? Her battle plan for Cerberus was like, did nobody? That's why I had Mike Hinky critique her plan and say, you know, in short, if it wasn't the most, you know, all for nothing, single roll of the dice, no way back plan in the history of warfare, I haven't found the one that is. And Honor says, that's fair, you know. <laughs> but Honor makes mistakes, okay? People don't realize that she does because they agree with her. Of course she was going to shoot the SOB, okay? The fact that it's a violation of military law. <laughs> has no bearing on the issue. We want her to do it. So it's not a mistake. Okay. What B9 does is they create situations in which I can't do, you know, the honor thing. Okay, I got to say, wait. Oh, jackasses. I got to do this the hard way now. <laughs> you know, and it's a stronger story. Because I did. One, one, of the, one of the things that we talk about a lot in Unite is, well, if we do that, we're going to nail David's feet to the floor, and we really don't want to do that. But there are also times where we look at each other and go, yeah, we need to nail David's feet to the floor. <laughs> Keep him out of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah there's, there's a lot of places where we, where we have ideas and we could go down paths that we actually choose to not go down because we know enough about where... David is going with the story to know, okay, this is of this is going to be of interest to him, but we don't know exactly where the story is going to go because in a lot of those instances, David doesn't yet know where, exactly where the story is going to go. So it's like, yeah, we can't actually do anything with that. Yeah. Like for for instance, one one of the things we've talked about, one of the things we've really wanted to do for a long time is to do a star map. <laughs> But the problem with the star map is you need to know where all the stars are. <laughs> and for some reasons that, that we won't go into, um, that uh, actually putting, putting those X's down on the piece of paper is, would be premature at this point. So, well, so we shelve the star map project until such a time one, as one of we can do that. One of the huge problems is that when I, I started this series, okay, in uh, 1993, okay? And you know what? I couldn't find any software to let me draw star systems at that point. So it was done pencil and paper, two-dimensional, okay? All right. How do you take a two-dimensional star map where somebody's been measuring the distances off on this flat two-dimensional surface and convert that into a three-dimensional star map? where the distances hold up, okay? We can retcon that. <laughs> okay, the amount of retconning involved in that one's going to be spectacular. I know it's one of the projects that we have, you know, on here and everything else. And I wouldn't mind too much if we did this and we got some minor differences and so forth, but there are some major plot elements that turn on how long it gets takes to get from point A to point B. Okay, if we suddenly redo the map and it only takes 30 days to get there instead of the 46 that it took in the, in the novel, then we have a problem. So there are some aspects of... It's, it's kind of like if I were starting the Honorverse today, 24 years after mm -hmm. I actually started it, um, there would be rather different beginning assumptions. Okay. 
Because, I mean, people need to think about what's happened, the changes in, in the tech we take for granted in the 20 odd years, okay? There's a limit to how much of that can be incorporated into the Honorverse because we have the starting tech set for the Honorverse and we're stuck with it, okay? Now there's a little bit that has happened, like the Unilink and so forth, that has crept in because there was nothing that I had done in the earlier <coughs> books that ruled the existence of the Unilink out when they start talking about their comms and so forth. You know, there was nothing in there that said you don't have this. But if you read like um, Beauty and the Beast, okay, Alfred's Unilink is fundamental to what he's able to do to save Allison's life, okay? And that technology would not have been available in the earlier Honorverse novels, all right? It is now. Um, <coughs> but there are things that cannot be changed because you can't suddenly introduce something that basic into the, in, into the system. And so I'm kind of stuck with 1990s starting assumptions in a book that's being written, you know, 25 years later. That's uh, one of the perils of a uh, long running series, especially in science fiction. science fiction. I mean, look at what happened to Doc Smith, you know, over the course of, of, of the Linsman novels. Um, so I'm in good company. But it's one of the reasons why I get a little irritated with some people who say, Weber's a Neanderthal, he doesn't understand computers and all, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, actually, i got a much better idea of what I, how I do it today. All right, unfortunately, that's the way I did it then, and I'm stuck with it. Um, and there are also some things that people just never really picked up on, like missiles. <sighs> you know, people have never understood that in the Honorverse, missiles have always been regarded as sign of kind of this huge dispersed array that's sending back information as the warheads close and so forth. They've never, I don't know why. They're all smart munitions. <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 I don't, people, they have been from the very beginning and people assume that they're not. And I don't know if it's because of the way I wrote them or, or what, but my fundamental assumption has always been that that's what's happening. And so when I get people say, oh, you yeah, know, we can do better than that today, I'm like. <laughs> so I recite the names of the presidents in reverse and possess <laughs> my soul in patience. <laughs> the thing is, you covered that really well, too, with the whole second. Grab a mic. You covered that really well with the second and third waves yep. because they blocked the incoming transmissions. So yes. That was. Well, you know what? I almost. <coughs> What I almost did was to use blocks of, uh, of, uh, of sodium strapped, you know, that they, they, they're, like, they're like cartridge jackets that come in around the, the laser to absorb the waste heat and vaporize. And then I would have clouds of gun smoke <laughs> trailing from the broadsides, okay? I came that close to doing that and decided it would have been too much of a good thing. Why not tracers? I <laughs> I think it would have been too much of a good thing. I, I couldn't even see it. That <laughs> would have been so cool. <laughs> but the sidewalls would have disrupted it, so it's okay. <laughs>That was part one of a two-part interview with David Weber and members of the Honorverse Consulting Group, View 9. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy. The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry. 
of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Adele sat on a straight chair in the dugout, watching the changes her data unit had found in collating views of the terrain around Hablinger, recorded by Pantellerian destroyers. Outside in the night, a woman sang, I wish I was a little bird. Though the destroyers didn't patrol, they lifted in pairs to escort supply ships in. Hablinger Pool was a bowl sculpted into the course of the Cephasis, just downstream of the town so the automatic logs of the ships recorded high-resolution imagery every time. Any variation in the surface, whether caused by weather or by human activity, appeared as a highlight on Adele's display. I'd fly up in a tree, sang the woman. From what Adele had seen, here and in Pearl Valley, women in the transformationist community were treated the same as men, or as nearly so as human beings were capable of doing. There were relatively few women in the community, however, she would have to check with Brother Graves or one of the senior people in Pearl Valley. But the reason could be as simple as statistically fewer women than men emigrating to a mining world. I'd sit and sing my sad little song. The woman sounded quite cheerful, and her voice was pleasant if untrained. Adele would have been interested to learn the internal society of the transformationists if, she smiled in self-mockery, somebody else had compiled the data. Speaking rather than singing, the woman concluded, But I can't stay here by myself. They're back, called Tovera softly through the blanket-covered entrance of the dugout. Hogg pulled the drape open for Daniel, then followed him in. Fresh mud stank on their utilities. Though the only light in the dugout was the data unit's holographic display, Daniel must have read the thought behind what Adele believed was a blank expression. The good thing about the location, he said, is that there's plenty of water to wash with. It's got just as much mud, I suppose, but there's probably less excrement in the form of fertilizer. I'll get you in, mistress, Hogg said. You'll likely be bathed in this muck, he grimaced and gestured with both hands. But I guess it wouldn't look right to the wogs when you was walking around if you didn't. What's this, Adele? Daniel said, bending forward to look at her display. She'd left it omnidirectional instead of cueing the unit to focus on her eyes alone. Why, this is the plan of the Pantellerian lines. I didn't realize we had anything so good. Adele stood and rubbed her shoulders. She wasn't sure what time it was, but she'd been working at the data unit since Daniel and Hogg went out an hour after full darkness to scout the enemy positions. I put it together after you left, she said, her eyes closed. I got into the logs of the Pantellerian squadron. I sent most of the information back to the Kaisha for Cori and Kazale to process, but I kept copies of the local imagery for myself. Well, that's wonderful, Daniel said. I'm surprised that... Well, I'm pleased that you were able to get into their logs so quickly. Adele smiled faintly, her eyes still closed. You're thinking that Pantellerian security must be very bad for me to open up warship data banks with no more than I have with me she said. She sat down again and stroked the case of her little data unit. In fact, their security was very good, but they had bad luck. She looked up at Daniel and half smiled again. She was tired, but her work and that of her companions seemed to be going well, and tomorrow this would be over one way or another. The new Pantellerian Navy Department the one put in place after independence, Adele said, suspected that all their codes and coding equipment were known to the Alliance. They were correct in that assumption. Daniel nodded. Hogg seemed to be focused wholly on the landscape display, but Adele knew that he was hearing and understanding the explanation. They asked Cinnabar for help revising their systems and procedures, Adele said. My other employer provided them with help of the highest quality, but of course we kept full records of what codes Pantelleria might now be using and how the codes were being generated. Hogg snorted in amusement. Daniel remained stone-faced for a moment, then smiled broadly. You may reasonably think it dishonorable for me to use information gained in this way, Adele said, knowing that she was speaking more to herself than to her audience. I made the decision without referring to you or to anyone else. If you get yourself killed because you were too proud to look at what somebody handed you, Hogg said, suddenly glaring at her, then I'll be sorry, because I like you and we all like you. 
But if you get me killed like that, I'll come out of hell for you, I swear. Fortunately, that situation doesn't arise, Daniel said mildly. I'm glad to have this imagery, though I don't think it changes anything we saw on the ground. See, Hog? Here's the strong point in front of us, and here's the listening post. There's six of them between strong points. It looks like 50 yards apart. Well, 50 meters. There are three listening posts to either side of each strong point, Adele said. She suddenly felt tired. There was always more to learn, but she had completed the tasks which had an immediate bearing on her entry into Hablinger. Her entry tomorrow into Hablinger. I think they're connected by wire. The strong points report to Hablinger headquarters by radio, including anything the listening posts have reported. But I don't pick up signals from the posts directly. Probably just two men in the LPs, Hogg said. With this slot, maybe only one. I'll slip up the last hundred yards and take care of them while the mistress waits. Then come get her and we both go through. There's no more manned posts, just wire, and that's no problem. Call, Daniel said. You don't need to come back. That's extra work and extra noise. You can sound like a field skipper three times in quick order. She won't hear me, master, Hogg said in irritation. And she'll get bloody lost on the way. I don't care how simple it seems to you. Adele hadn't heard the older man use that frustrated tone to Daniel in the past. It was justified. Hogg had put into words the analysis which Adele had made in her head already. I'll catch it, said Daniel calmly. I'll bring her up to the LP and wait there till the two of you come back, and I won't get lost. Hogg remained completely still for a moment. Then he said, Right. I don't need more bloody exercise at my age. Looking away, he muttered, Sorry, master. You need a distraction, Tovera said, without turning to face the others. She squatted in the dugout's opening with a corner of the blanket drawn back, her submachine gun in her hand. We'll have a distraction, Hogg said. I'm going to set a flare midway to the post. When we're there and ready to head in the town, I'll trip it with a clacker. Nobody'll be looking toward us even if, well, if the mistress is having a bit of trouble with the going. A clacker won't work, Tovera said. It won't have enough juice at 300 meters. I'll put it closer then. Hogg said, just so the wogs are looking to our lines and not out to the side. The clacker was a hand-squeezed generator that set off a blasting cap. Adele didn't have any idea how great a charge would remain at the end of a thousand feet of thin wire, but Tovera was probably correct. No, Tovera said. She was icy calm through the whole discussion. I'll be twenty feet from the flare, holding the ends of your wire between my thumb and forefinger. I'll feel the spark and I'll set off the flare. She turned to glance at Adele. Keeping radio silence, mistress, she said. Yes, that sounds good, said Daniel. His tone was casual, but Adele and probably the others knew that the discussion was over. Now let's get some sleep. Starting an hour after dark tonight, we all have a great deal to do. Adele shut down her data unit and hunched, the ceiling was low, to the bedstead she had chosen. The frame was plastic tubing and there was no mattress over the slats, but she had slept on much worse. Yes, she said, putting her rolled jacket at the end of the frame for a pillow. She fell asleep almost at once. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a takeout order of three first ladies, one burn one, clean up the kitchen, plus two cows, make them cry and paint them red at the diner at the end of the universe. And the thanks and praise of a star nation and its dependencies to David Weber, and members of BU9. Please join us next time here at the hammering part of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.